Hey, we're at it again with a closer look. We're glad you're checking us out. Mark Shine, Mark Miller, and this show kind of turns it around a little bit. We're kind of concentrating on the end of the year and then looking into tournaments. Yeah, we're wrapping up the league races and going through that, and then we're going to do some tournament things, too. It's a good uh -huh. time of year. Hey, let's review the leagues instead of reviewing the games, and I get to start with the WBL. The Western Buckeye League this year was Ottawa Glandorf's league. They did not get challenged. They did not get tested, at least throughout a whole game or the season. You can see there, 9-0 in the league. The next closest, Shawnee and Wapak with three losses, and then Elida and Van Wert with four. Elida has the great record. All four of those losses were WBL losses, but Ottawa Glandorf, the only loss they had was to Lexington non-league, and they really... Uh, are gaining momentum and getting ready for tournament. This is Dre Jay Schrader, Player of the Year in the WBL. The concern with OG and Tyson McLaughlin is Bryce Schrader, their outside shooter extraordinaire, sprained an ankle badly in their game last Friday against Elida, and we'll have to see if that affects him early on in tournament or not. Uh, much improved teams this year, I thought. Shawnee, although a little bit inconsistent, and Kenton, they, on any given night, could have beat anybody in that league. Some teams that look for a good tournament run, Wapak could have some if they gain some consistency. But Ottawa Glandorf, no doubt, the team in Division Three, all the other teams in, are in Division Two tournament, they could make a run all the way to Columbus. All right, let's move and take a look at the Northwest Conference. And much like what you mentioned with Ottawa Glandorf, this conference belonged to the Crestview Knights this year. They're 19 and three. Remember when they were four and three back in a while ago? We're thinking, ah, maybe not. Well, yes, they were. 8-0 in conference play. Their only close game in conference play was an eight-point win over Jefferson way back on January 5th. They averaged 68.4 points per game offensively. They gave up just 41.3. Jay Vanessa, Derek Stout, Wade Sheets, Drew Klein, a tremendous year for Coach Best, and they are going to roll into the tournament. We'll talk about those brackets later on, but the Crestview Knights in great shape heading into the tournament. Lincoln View, well, they started out 6-1 and one overall, but then they were on a four-game losing streak before they got it. Those were all non-league games before they got it going. Lincoln View's only loss in conference play was to Crestview, and they finished 15-7. and seven. I kind of like what Columbus Grove did this year in a way. I mean, they were 4-4 four and four in conference play, but they were very competitive. They lost a three-point game to Paulding, a three-point game in overtime, and a one-point game to Bluffton. They had 10 losses by 10 points or less. I'm not thinking maybe Columbus Grove might be one of those dark horses they had in the conference play, or the tournament play. And the league as a whole, not a particularly good year. They won just 36.8% of their non-conference games. So the conference as a whole, down a little bit, but uh, looking forward to some tournament runs perhaps. Let's look at the Midwest Athletic Conference. This was a top-heavy conference this year with three teams that spent a lot of part, parts of the season being ranked and they could have won a lot of other leagues too. Marion Local won it, undefeated you see. St. Henry versus Sales, even with two losses, they were right down at it at the end and lost a couple of very close games to St. Henry and Marion Local. And then I thought they had some upset capable teams throughout the year. Delphi St. John's there you can see, Minster, and I also thought Coldwater on any given night could have given any of these teams a game. But you can see number five and number six, St. Henry and Versailles, Marion Local wins it. They're not ranked, but they're the best team in the league. So lots of tournament wins ahead for these teams. Let's move on and take a look at the track and uh, what happened with the Three Rivers Athletic Conference. Well, this was Toledo St. John's Conference this year. Uh, player of the year was Vincent Williams, Jr. He was a senior who plays for Toledo St. John's. They were 19-3 and, and 14-0 and in the track. They're also the fifth rated team in Division I. Toledo St. John's did not lose a game in the state of Ohio. They went to San Diego for a tournament at Christmas time, lost twice out there. Then lost to Detroit De La Salle Collegiate. And uh, maybe their closest game was Lima Senior, a 53-46 win uh, for Toledo St. John's. St. Francis was second, along with Whitmer. They were both 11-3 uh, and 17-5. And that includes Whitmer's win over Lima Senior on Monday night, 57-46, in that makeup game from last Friday. The local teams, well, Finley was 13-9, 7-7. Ryan Young, none, was a first-team all-conference. Ryan Roth was second team. And B.J. Miller for Lima Senior as they finished uh, with 11-11 and 6-8. And B.J. Miller was first team, and Jaleel King was second team in the track. And those two teams have a chance to match up later on. We'll talk about that. We'll preview some things in the tournament later on. Let's look at the NWCC. This was a two-team league. Everybody was chasing him, and Perry did a good job of chasing him. Got better and better. Those young players got better as the season went on. 
Temple Christian with their scoring ability and the outside shot, they were always a threat, but this was Elgin and USV. Elgin got upset by uh, Waynesfield Goshen, that's where they got their one loss, and then when they went head to head, Elgin squeaked away a win to get the tie. They both finished seven and one. How about uh, USV's big win at PG? A very good team up in Putnam County. That's their only loss was the USV. So you're looking for USV and Elgin to make some noise in tournament. All right, let's take a look at a couple of conferences that were dominated by the Pandora Gilboa Rockets. Let's go to the BBC first. They were 21 and one overall and 11 and 0 in the BBC. They led the conference in field goal percentage. They were also the top three point field goal shooting team in the conference. Uh, Drew Johnson was player of the year at averaging better than 17 points a game and making better than 50% of his field goal attempts. Jared Brees was second team and Cooper McCullough, Eli Phillips were both third team in the BVC. They did a lot of it because of what they did defensively. They held uh, four teams in the 20s or less. They had nine teams in the 30s, six more teams in the 40s. The highest points they gave up was at 55 points that they gave up to USV that Mark mentioned a moment ago and 54 to Columbus Grove. Uh, North Baltimore was second. They were 17 and five, nine and two in the conference. Their losses were to PG uh, and to Van Buren. Julian Hagemeyer was a first team all player for them in the conference. And Van Buren, they were 15, seven, nine and two. Their losses were to PG uh, and uh, another loss to Hopewell Loudon. So good year for them. Matthew Ayers was a first team all conference player in the BVC for them. Take the PCL and once again, we're talking about the Pandora Gilboa Rockets. And how about the year that they had as a conference, the PCL won 60% of their non-conference games. You can see how well those teams did right there in their, their conference matchups as well as non-conference. And those five teams that you see right there, they were 55 and 18 in non-conference games. That's a 75.3% winning mark. The PG's closest game was to Miller City, 44-42. They also beat Ottaville, 59-51. I like what Miller City did this year. Ottaville and Grove, or Ottaville and uh, Fort Jennings split. One was a conference game, one was not. But they're going to play each other in the tournament. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on, too. A good year for the PCL. Watch for some of those teams to do some damage as we get into the tournament play. But Pandora Gilboa wins them both. Good year for them. Yep. All right, we've looked at the leagues and the teams. Now let's look at the individuals. Some stat stuffers from this last week. Logan Dre from Perry had 30 points and eight threes in their win over Macomb. They won in overtime, 77-70. Perry made 13 threes, and Macomb was 14 out of 30 on three attempts. They were lighting it up from the outside that night. Hey, how about guard somebody, huh? You yeah, know what I mean? <laughs> play a little 27 defense. threes. All right, I got Brody Bowman talking about threes. Brody Bowman had 34 and made three three-point field goals as Temple Christian defeated Monclova Christian, 74-48. His teammate, Noel Howell, well, he stepped up with 20 in that game and had five three-point field goals. In the last four games, Howell has 18 three-point field goals and averages 20 points a game. And I get a chance to see both of those teams, Perry and uh, uh, Temple Christian tonight in tournament action. All right, Dylan Thompson from USV. Last week he had 17 assists, and that's why he was a stat stuffer. This week he had 12 points on four threes in a 68-42 win over Allen East. So he can dish it and he can score. All right, and Zane Miller had 25 with five threes for Lincoln View as they beat Perry. 84-70, his teammates Tristan Miller and Caden Wingwald each had 19 points as well, and Ringwald had nine, uh, three nine, three three-point field goals for nine points out of his 19. Daniel Unruh from Elida went up to Ottawa Glandorf. They lost the game 82-73, but he had 33 points, including three threes. He, he was hitting from everywhere. He really had a great game. Owen Hegel, he led OG, he had 22. Lots of points in that game. Very entertaining game, even though a nine-point win for the Titans. Yeah, we get to our plays of the week. We're going to break down some Owen Hegel moves a little bit later on. And how about Tyler Moore now for Shawnee? Now, when Tyler's been injured for much of the year, he played the first couple of games, got hurt. Graz has been getting back into it as we hit the last game of the regular season, had his best game of the year. Uh, he had, uh, what, uh, 19 points and a three-point field goal as Shawnee got Salina 51-50 on a basket beater, buzzer beater at the end of the game. Good game for Tyler Moore. Glad to see him back and playing well. That's right. Our last stat stuffer of the week is Jaron Sharp from Kenton. 27 points, five threes in their win over Bath, 62-57, so they needed them all. Landon Rush chipped in with Kenton. He had 19 points and three more threes. So congratulations to those stat stuffers. 
It's time for Rule of the Week. Put your officiating whistle on. We're going to talk about slapping the backboard. Slapping the backboard. That jump that That's right. Well, first of all, remember when you and I could jump and <laughs> slap the backboard. And second, remember when we played, it was illegal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we talked about technical fouls the other night on the air about that. Well, is it a technical foul to slap the backboard? And the answer is yes and no. But there's a key word. If it is intentional, it's a technical foul. Uh, if the ball is in the cylinder or a chance to go in, you slap the backboard intentionally. As a technical foul, but just to make contact with the backboard when you're trying to make a play, not so much. It has to be intentional. It has to interfere with the ball trying to go in the back basket as well. All right, there you have it. Hey, we'll be back in a minute with Plays of the Week. Hey, it's time for Plays of the Week, and we're going to start at the Supreme Court. There was a lot of great plays up there you yes. can look at. Let's, let's show them a few. Well, what we're going to look at, Mark, is you know, we've been focusing on post plays because I like post players. Well, tonight we're going to look at point guard play, and who better than Owen Hegel? Watch the move right here. He catches the ball, and he makes this jab step here, and ball fakes, and then a nice cross dribble. Look at the cross dribble right there. Splits the defenders, goes right to the rim, and scores. That's cross dribble the way it's supposed to be done, low and quick. And then here's a spin move right here. He takes the ball, or not spin, a cross dribble move right here. Takes the ball, takes it to his right, and then cross dribbles back to his left for the pull-up jumper right here. I thought you were going right. Nope, I'm going left this time. Pull-up jump shot right here. His third move then is the spin move. He's got the ball over here on the wing, comes off the screen, plays a little hide and seek behind the screen, and gets right here and spins, and a little short jumper. This guy's got all the moves. Plus, he can yep. shoot the three ball on top of it. Here he goes again. We'll take a look at it. Here's a screen coming from Dybul. He accepts that screen, and he can come off this and right here shoot it, but he chooses to play a little hide and seek. You can see he's got Unruh, who's a pretty good defender, jumping all over the place, and he just goes inside and scores right there. And then we always talk about that three-point field goal and how it comes at some opportune times. Well, in this case, it comes after a missed shot because everybody's scrambling around for the rebound. And after the scramble, we got Schrader standing there all by himself on the sideline. He bombs a three in. But everybody loses their man when you get set up in these defensive situations to rebound. Let's scramble around and watch him head right to the three-point line. And guess who finds him with the ball? Eagle. And he buries the three right there. And, of course, Mark talked about a moment ago. We hope he gets back for the tournament as healthy as he goes through that. Here's a nice play by Elida. We talked about how well they run their set plays. This is Isaac McAdams going to run a slip screen. Here comes the slip right here. He sets it, jumps into the lane, and goes up inside, scores with the left hand. Elida runs their sets as well as anybody around. They always have. Here's the play. Pass goes around. The pass to Unruh on the side. And here comes McAdams off. And we're going to get this little slip, slip screen action here in just a second. He comes to set it right here and then goes inside. You can see his man hesitates to the perimeter. Why not? It was Unruh. you got to guard him out there anyway. Then it finishes with the left hand, and they run their sets as well as anybody around when they're hot. And they're eight, what, 18 and four yep. right now? Yep. 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 Great year. Hey, we want to tease next week's show just a little bit. We're going to go over the players of the year by league, coaches of the year by league, a lot of proposed rule changes yep. that Mark will discuss. Obviously, not all of those will be accepted, but we'll talk right. about them. Yep. Some good ones. We'll even throw in some that we want to see. <laughs> yeah. And then we're going to name our all-fun-to-watch team. Mark and I like this. We go around and we do all these games. We, we look yeah. at guys that are fun to watch because they play so hard. They play fundamentally sound. Right. They may not be the MVP of their team, but we like to watch them. We're going to name that team next week. Yeah, we like to watch guys who really get after and play hard. We're going to yeah. put that up next week. Yeah. All right, we'll be back in a minute with our final segment. Hey, for our final segment, we want to go into the bright spots, and we've got a lot of them, and you get to start. We do. One of my favorite bright spots belongs to one of my favorite people. This is Roger Zorn right here. Roger is a Finley basketball official, and on his 75th birthday, he officiated his final high school basketball game. You can see they gave him a plaque there. Roger's been officiating for 28 years. Now figure that out. Hey, I'm too old to get involved in officiating. Well, if he is 75 in his 28th year, do the math. He started late. He also officiates softball. He's an instructor for both for officials. 
He is the secretary for the Greater Finley Basketball Officials Association and a great ambassador for the game. And congratulations, Roger, to a great career. And we hope you have a great a retirement in officiating. That's awesome. Hey, Olivia Koenig from Bluffton. She had 14 points to help her team beat Fort Jennings. And she went over 1,000 points. She's just a junior in first team Northwest Conference. Congratulations, Olivia. Seems like most of ours have been seniors, right, this yeah. year. I know yeah. Brody Bowman was a junior, but I'm kind of proud of that. See, what a junior step up. That's a lot, of, a lot fewer basketball games. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to Eric Ritter. He is a senior at Corey Rossin. He leads the BBC in scoring this year and with a 26 points and a win over Ridgemont, 75-56. He goes over 1,000 points in his career, and he will finish up as a, a member of the first team all Blanchard Valley Conference and the leading scorer in the conference this year. That's Eric Ritter from Corey Rawson. Hey, last Saturday afternoon, we went up to Findlay, the University of Findlay, and did a doubleheader men's and women's basketball game live, and we had a little extra added attraction. There you can see Taryn Sullivan and Ellie Dackett. They've dated for a long time. They're both from Bath High School. And after the senior night presentation, Taryn got a ring from his dad, turned around, hit the knee, and Ellie must have said yes, because everybody's happy. That's unique. That, I have never seen it. That is different. A proposal in the middle of the basketball floor, and you can see his teammates supported it fully. Congratulations, Taryn and Ellie, two great kids from local Bath High School. Yeah, and you know, then he had to go play a basketball game, right? Yes, and, he did. But you and know what? Isn't that how you break him in right? Well, Here, well yeah. That's that's... Okay, I'm going to go play hoops. Plan on being in a gym the rest <laughs> of your life, Ellie. Here we are. Yeah, congratulations. Both yeah. those are two fine people from Bath, two seniors now in college. Well, Ellie's at BG, right? Yeah. 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 Really good luck to you guys as well. That is exactly right. And, you and got then one. Uh, I do student teaching now, and so I get around to a lot of different schools. And I noticed something last week that I took a picture of and sent it to my good buddy Mark, because you don't see this every day in a public school. There is the state motto and the national motto. We trust in God and all thing, with all God, all things are possible. And so I did a little research. I went up and down the hallways. That's inside every classroom at this particular school. And they were also the best behaved and disciplined and polite and respectful kids that I've ever been around. Think there's a little connection there? I think they've got good parents, they've got good administrators, they've got good teachers, and people know the right thing to care about, and I was very, very impressed. I'll sub in that school every day. Yeah. Yeah, well, they we, were great. We saw that sign last year at Napoleon. Napoleon, up the on gym, the wall in the gym. saw it in every classroom. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Glad Pretty cool. That. So thanks yeah. to that public school. Absolutely. Hey, it's time for College Player of the Week. And Mark's got a All local right. guy. We've got Carson Monger. Remember when Carson played down at New Bremen? Well, he graduated in 2015. There's a four-year letterman in basketball. His uh, junior year, he averaged 16.1 points per game and five rebounds. His senior year, 19-9, 8.7 rebounds, 2.7 steals, 2.4 assists, and 1.4 blocks. He is a 6'2", 200-pounder. He played, also played football for three years at New Bremen, ran track for a year. And where is he at now? He is at Lake Superior State University at LSSU. His freshman year, he started 18 games, averaged better than eight points a game. His sophomore year, he started all 26 games, averaged 11.7. This year, he's the first sub off the bench, averaging 5.3 points per game. LSSU is 22 and 6, 16 and 4 in the GLIAC. They average 81 points a game. They play in the tournament Wednesday night in the GLIAC tournament. They are the number two seed. They play Grand Valley State on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. The number one seed was Ferris State. And Grand Valley State and uh, LLSSU split during the regular season. So big game for Carson Monger and one of the guys I like watching when he played high school basketball down at New Bremen. All right, I apologize. I said Cole Monger and it's Carson. And the ice is still on the ground as far north as they are. <laughs> they're, they're still playing up. hockey, aren't they? Ooh, the Sioux, way up there. There you go. All right, it's time for our preview. And this time, we're going to preview the tournament brackets. Mark's got Division One and Toledo. All right, we're going to go through the brackets in order, much like we did on our show. Well, the number one seed in this bracket was in the top, and that was Toledo St. John's. We talked about them earlier. But in this bracket right here, it's Waite and Finley. Now, this is an interesting basketball game. As you see right there, Waite's 8-3. and three. They were two, just 2-10 two and 10 since January 9th. They play in the Toledo City League, of course, and should Finley get by them. Waiting for them is Anthony Wayne. Anthony Wayne was 10, 15 and 7, 10 and 4, and they play in the Northern Lakes League. Well, who are those four losses to? 
How about Sylvania Southview, who was 21 and 1, and Sylvania Northview, who was 19 and 3. So they lost four games to two very quality teams. At the bottom there, you see Lima Senior matches up with Springfield. Springfield 6 and 16 in that same league, just 5 and 9. They lost their last four games, and including one to Anthony Wayne, are just 1 and 5 in February. And you can see the matchup there. If Lima Senior and Finley both should get out to that district semifinal game on March 7th, it would be at the University of Toledo. They split during the regular season. Lima Senior won by five in January. Finley won the overtime game a couple weeks ago. And that would be an interesting matchup at the University of Toledo. All right, let's look at Division Two in the Ohio Northern District. And there you can see the number one seed was Wasion. Number two seed was Elida. Now, not only was Wasion number one seed, they are number, well, we're just looking at the top right here, I guess, with Elida. Some games that could come out of that that would be very interesting. Shawnee and Wapak if they get by their first round. And then either one of those teams against Elida, if Elida can beat that Defiance Bryan winner, because Wapak beat Elida earlier in the year, I think any of those would be really good semi matchups for the right to go to Bowling Green. Wasion's on the bottom of that bracket, and it really is their district to win or lose, I believe. Wasion number one in the state in Division II, 22-0, and as you look through those, certainly teams can have a great game. We talked about Kenton getting better and better at 14-8, but Wasion, if they play the way they can, should get out of that bracket and get to BG. All right, let's move on to the Division Three brackets then. Take a look at that. This is the one that's at Van Buren, first of all. This is kind of a wide open area. Number four, Coldwater, uh, who has losses by three to Versailles, three to Fort Recovery, three to Delphi St. John's in their losses right there. They played Jefferson, who's won four out of their last five and finished eight and 14. At the bottom, I think the LCC Thunderbirds got a good draw. They match up with a nine and 13 Elmwood. And Elm Elmwood's lost a couple of close games, but you look at what LCC has done. They won three in a row before playing Defiance and losing on Saturday. And when LCC gets everything right, they could do a lot, a lot of damage in that term. That's kind of a wide open bracket, and obviously Van Buren's the favorite. You look at the other side of the bracket, though, and what happens in this Division Three. This is Ottawa Glandorf, and this is theirs to win. As you can see right here, the interesting thing in this whole draw was Tenora was the second seed. Remember Paul Wayne at Holgate? Well, they play a fundamental, solid style of basketball. It's a very slow and disciplined play. Uh, they are decided as the number two seed to jump into the same bracket with Ottawa Glandorf. So instead of the number one and number two seeds meeting in the finals that, of the district, that cannot happen. They will have to meet in the district semifinals. Used to be you couldn't do that, Mark. Now the seed team can go wherever they choose, and that's the interesting matchup that takes place there. Look at that Bluffton Paulding thing. That, the Paulding won that game by 19 in the regular season. That was right after Luke Deniker was lost with a, with a knee injury. Bluffton's played much better lately. That could be a good matchup right there. All right, Division Four at Elida. This is a very, very competitive sectional. You're going to see teams with a lot of good records. We're going to look at the Crestview part of it, the bottom part of the bracket. They were the number one seed, 19 and three. But look, Antwerp could come out of there. They've got 13 wins. Fort Jennings, 15. Ottoville, 17 and five. So there could be some really good competitive games all the way through to get out of that bracket. And then the other end of it, Wayne Trace was the seed. And again, teams like Lincoln View, Hicksville, Delphi St. John's has the least amount of victories um, of the, any of the teams on this bracket right now. And I wouldn't want to play them in tournament. They get good every year at tournament time. Aaron Elwer does a great job. So second round, you could have teams with great records playing against each other, and anything goes. I think there's going to be some upsets in this Elida district. Well, the other thing is Wayne Trace had some injuries towards the last part of the season. They had to get healthy before they get into the tournament as well, or they could go uh, rather quickly. All right, let's move on to the other D4. Let's look at the one that takes place at uh, Liberty Benton. First of all, uh, in the Kaleida part of this, you see Liberty Lipsick and Patrick Henry will match up first. A couple of teams that will then get after Kaleida. Kaleida beat Lipsick 42-28 in the regular season. Uh, Lipsick and Patrick Henry have struggled last part of the year. Lipsick's just three and eight, and Patrick Henry four and seven in their last 11 games. Look down at the bottom down there. Watch out for Columbus Grove. I think they're a dangerous basketball team. North uh, Baltimore, you can see in there, they uh, are 17 and five, but they give up 70 points to Van Buren. They give up 70 to USV, and the way Columbus Grove can shoot threes, that could be a, a game that would be very interesting should it get to that point. Let's go to the other half of that bracket then. This is the part that's played at Van Buren. Miller City was seated fourth. I always like Miller City and what they do in that particular conference. You see Corey is going to match up with Macomb. A couple of teams have struggled a little bit during the regular year. Macomb won that game in the regular season by 20. 
but that was way back on January 5th. And then PG and Holgate, and you know, we look at PG, Mark, I, I think PG is very, very good. Obviously, they've beaten every team in this, re in this division or in this district, except Patrick Henry and Holgate, who they didn't play. So they're obviously the favorites of 21 and one. And when we did our bracket show way back a couple weeks ago, I picked PG to go a long way, and last year I did that, and they flamed out. So they're hoping I didn't Different jinx them. Different year, older this. kids. Yeah, they hope I didn't well, jinx them this year. That's right. All right, the Division Four district at Wapak. St. Henry at the top, 19-3. and three. Of course, they're playing very, very well and got stronger as they went down the stretch, beat Versailles in a great game that we were able to broadcast. Now, if they get through and Minster gets through in the semi, that's a rematch in the MAC. Even though St. Henry's better, better record, they won the first time around, it's hard to beat a good team, and Minster is good. That could be a tough battle for them. In the other end of the bracket, you've got Marion Local coming in there as the number one seed, and they beat St. Henry, but are they on a crash course towards a rematch? Maybe. I don't see any other upsets in this part of the bracket. It looks like maybe St. Henry, Marion Local, again, for the right to go to Kettering to the regional. Let's look at the D3 things that are going on down south. And, of course, they've been playing for a little while already. You can look at this. You can see some of the teams that we cover in our area. You see Versailles is in there. Uh, and, of course, they are the favorites. They go through this very often in the southwestern brackets. The higher seeds choose to play early and don't take buys. So Versailles is obviously a favorite there. As we move on to our next screen, Here's, uh, uh, again, some teams that play in that particular area. Fort Laramie, Mechanicsburg. Um, Fort Laramie, of course, highly favored to go through that particular area as well. And as we go to the next bracket, as we go, there we go. I guess that's the last one we had. Anna's playing yet. Don't worry, forget about them. So is Indian Lakes playing right now. They upset Troy Christian. So lots going on down in the Southwest right now Anna as well. Anna can make some noise. Anna can make some yeah. noise. We liked them during the regular yeah. season. Had some yeah. tough losses, and yeah. we saw them play some good basketball as well. So some yeah. good things going on right now in the Southwest. They're a week ahead of everybody else. Hey, it's a fun time of year. We've got lots of games. Let's throw up on the screen there what we've got coming your way on the broadcast schedule. It's tournament time. The girls are one week ahead, obviously. They're in the districts. Boys going into the sectionals. Lots of games, weeknights and weekends, double headers on the weekends. Guys, girls, you got it. Tune in and stay abreast of what's happening all the way through Sunday, March 4th, when you got that game that Mark mentioned in those districts up there. All right, we got to say goodbye this time. Next week, we're going to finish it off for this yeah. season. That'll be our last show next week. Come back and join us. We'll close things out on a closer look.